But hello, hello, it's Dean and Dave, and we're here for the Too Sexy for January uh, meetup, or Too Sexy for Meetup. I don't know what we are really going to call this, but I think Too Sexy for Meetup, and this is the January 2023 edition of this. And uh, this is our first one ever that's being live recorded. Uh, well, I say live. Yeah, we're recording it live, but yeah, you're probably not watching it live. And sometimes I crack myself up, but welcome everybody. We've got a few uh, live guests here and uh, you'll probably be seeing this, my guess is somewhere on YouTube uh, after the fact. So if you're joining us after the fact, then welcome. Uh, feel free to join us for a live event anytime. These will be uh, every month. Uh, the first Friday of every month is the current plan for this at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, hopefully that'll accommodate more of an international audience so it's not too late in the evening over in Europe and uh, not too early in the morning uh, further out. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get things kind of rolling here. I don't want this thing to get super formal, uh, but this is one of the months that we had uh, slated for actually kind of having a bit of a, a presentation format for this one last month when we got together. Uh, we kind of had a round robin of just people sharing different ideas and uh, kind of different tips and tricks and things like that, that uh, kind of showcase type things. We, we're going to do multiple different kind of formats for this meetup moving forward. Um, but this month is kind of one of those where we're going to kind of split the time between uh, not really a formal presentation, but me just sharing some, some um, experiences that I've had with uh, uh, using uh, too sexy in the context of source control, uh, in particular using Git and GitHub. Um, and then that'll be a little bit more of an interactive session. And then we'll open it up towards the end uh, for kind of an open mic style. If you have some, you know, five minute tips or so, and we're not like clock watching or anything, but, you know, just kind of short tips and things that you've picked up over the time that you want to share with the group and could, could make uh, uh, help somebody's life be a little bit easier. So thank you for joining. Uh, we're going to kick off a little bit with some buzz and uh, announcements in the community. And I, if I happen to miss anything, uh, let me know uh, on this. But for those that don't know, I mean, this is all really about uh, 2SXC and uh, in the context of using it within a DNN instance or an Octane instance. And if you're not familiar with either one of those platforms, I encourage you to go out to octane.org. That's O-Q-T-A-N-E dot org. And uh, it's very similar in architecture uh, to DNN, but is more of a modern um, stack there with ASP.NET Core and Blazor. And um, if you're interested in DNN, you can uh, learn a lot about it at dnncommunity.org. Of course, both of those uh, platforms are on GitHub, and you can get to their uh, their um, GitHub instances out there as well. But to SXC, for those that don't aren't too familiar with it or are new to the platform, is more of a content management system that sits on top of one of those two um, application frameworks and gives a, a nice editing experience for the end user at the end or administrators that are editing content on a website. And this meetup is really structured to just talk about all things 2.6c. And uh, so feel free to go out there. One thing that I looked at before the meeting, just kind of in, in light of announcements and stuff and things that have happened, um, the latest LTS release or long-term support release into sexy looks like it is still 14.12.3. And that was released. I'm out on the GitHub uh, repo for 2SXC. Looks like that was released right before our last meetup. So November the 29th, but there's some exciting things happening as always. I think uh, Daniel Mettler meant, uh, who actually joined us last month and mentioned that they're trying to work off of a cadence of having a major release twice a year uh, for this. So you can kind of expect that. But they were already working on the version 15 release of this. And I thought I would highlight a few of the things in it. Um, they don't have an LTS release of this because I think it's just too so new and fresh, but I would expect that to, you know, be 
not too far behind over the next couple of months. I'm guessing uh, they'll get to an LTS version of 15. But there's a nice blog article uh, that is posted right here on the release out on GitHub, and I'll have that pulled up. And it's a very long article, but I'll kind of highlight some of the things that I've seen on here. And if anybody's had any experience with it or has played around with it, um, I have not. I haven't even installed it on the system yet, so I don't have a whole lot of awareness of these specific things, but I thought this blog article was really nice. I think one of the big things that's included in it is uh, the inclusion of Google Translate within the editing experience. So if you bring up your normal kind of editor for a, a, a view, then you get this translation capabilities right in the top right corner. And I'm assuming that applies to all of the fields that are related to that particular content type that's shown for the view. And you could auto translate all or don't translate any or not sure what translate all. I guess that's just not something that's going to happen automatically when you update the fields. So I guess that's the difference between those two. Um, but that looks, looks really neat. And he's got an example here of going from English to Arabic. Arabic. Wait, how did I say that? Did I say that right? <laughs> Arabic, I think. Is the way you say that. Um, <laughs> how would you say that in French Canadian, Daniel? Arabic. Arabic. Okay. All right. Are you <laughs> hunting Arabic or are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I see a few more people have joined. Hey, Steve. And hey, Daniel. And hey, Alessandra. The DNN diva herself has joined. Um, let's see. In addition to that, it looks like there's a few small things that they have done. Like I thought this one was interesting that um, I think they had followed a convention for a while of always automatically whenever you create a new view um, that it would automatically have an underscore as a part of the file name. And I think that was related to both convention and a particular security practice that is typically used to render partials and things like that for um, for razor based uh, platforms or, or frameworks. And um, they have now by default, because that didn't matter or apply really anymore to to sexy that they have now changed the default experience to uh, not have the underscore, but you still can use the underscore uh, naming convention if you so desire to do so. Let's see. Looks like they've gone with a major upgrade to Tiny MCE Editor. Um, I am sure there's a lot of details here that would uh, that would mean something to a lot of people, but I don't know them. <laughs> So I'll just leave it at, oh, they upgraded Tiny MCE, but evidently that's a big deal. Um, has any, by the way, is anybody that's on actually played with 2SEC15 yet? Yeah, I actually have. I had a, what a, whatever the 1403, whatever it was, the, the LTS. And it had a little bug that was kind of annoying that when you, if you had a bilingual site, you could give each side, say, of a photo, a different caption that worked great, but you couldn't tell the how would they treat the uh, image differently. So mm. typically French is a little bit longer than English. So I would often would like to do the photo for its full height on the French side and on the English side to have it uh, just at the center. And that didn't work, but I upgraded to 15 and it works perfectly now. So. As far as all the, I don't know, I can't even count how many new features. I haven't really checked anything out. Just that uh, it seems to work as good as 1403 or whatever it was, but uh, without a couple of little bugs. So a step uh -huh. in the right direction. That is nice to know. I'm always a little bit nervous, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe too nervous, but typically for production sites, I just don't go on the bleeding edge for a lot of these things just because of, you know, one little feature mishap can, can wreak havoc. But that being said, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a great strategy or not, because the LTS sometimes has those same things and there's no fixes that are put right onto that version anyway. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of hmm. choose your own path there, I, I suppose. But uh, for right now, we haven't really touched any, uh, upgrades to non-LTS versions. So 
Um, it, it, it seems to be if that if you report a bug on the LTS and it's a little bug, that it that he might decide to just shovel it off to the next version. But yeah. if it's a big one, then he'll issue another LTS for essentially the same version. So, but if it's a bug you need fixed, then you're kind of well, you kind of, kind of go got to go on the bleeding edge. But so far, no bruises. Well, that's good to know. Good to know. Um, I I think there's plans for bigger stuff to happen in in, in the new context or in the context of uh, Tiny MCE version six here. So, at least there's some hints to that uh, here uh, with that. Um, it looks like they upgraded a few of the third party kind of dependencies that they've got. One of which is Tiny MCE uh, CSV helper and Razor Blade, which I think is 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 theirs, right? Or is that truly a third party I, I think it's just another project within their world that they 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 have there but i guess they upgraded that within the context of too sexy um bunch of other little details as far as uh, some api changes that have been made and some new uh apis related to productivity so it uh, looks like they're a little bit more uh involved uh options here for the uh, turn on uh, feature within a page context. So that's nice. Um, some image related service. Uh, uh, yep. I am. Uh, yeah. To, for web piece support and so forth. It looks like they got some fallback uh, type um, options there for a description as well. And, and some of the tags that are used in the rendered HTML. Um, and I haven't read all this in super fine detail, so sorry if I'm kind of flailing through this, but I'm trying to look for things that are kind of big ticket items. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, looks like they got some attention on the GPS area there, which, you know, this is a great little uh, area of Too Sexy that I discovered by happenstance because of a field type uh, that's in there. But I know many of you probably have used this before where you can leverage some of the uh, the um, GPS coordinate type stuff to be able to, to build maps and so forth for location-based uh, uh, lists or views that you need to, to look at. It's a neat little feature there. Um, I think it was called at one point, it was called a GPS picker. Is that right? Or something like that. Really neat little discovery I made a few years ago. Uh, let's see. I don't know much about the Atom asset stuff, but uh, looks like they've made some, some new ability there and some other little small database cleanup and things like that. Um, I did notice one thing that they're doing, and I think this may have happened before um, version 15 here, but it looks like there's a um, there's a new JSON file that's a part of this. Um, if and it, the reason I'm bringing this one up is because of the subject matter today. But like as you're working with the Git and you know the state of an app, um, everything has been saved in the past in a an app.xml uh, format, and now there's a new uh, JSON file that holds some of that data, but I haven't quite figured all that out yet. Um, Alessandra, I know you've played around with some of this too, or at least maybe have just seen it. Do you know much about that and what it's used for yet? I'm sorry, you said ask, say that again? Sorry, I put you on the spot there, but you know how the app XML file holds all the data, you know, kind of metadata um, associated with a particular app? I think it's, I think what I, or what I, I saw in it is that it just kind of, gives the XML of the fields and everything. Like when you export the content type, that's why they add them. Yeah, I was talking about the new file that shows up in that area now. There's like a JSON formatted file in addition to the XML file now. And I'm kind of curious as to- Yes, what that is, doing. sorry. That is about like the fields and everything while the XML file is more about the content oh, okay. of the file. When you export the- the, the app and or, or it, it comes in as a JSON part JSON part XML. So I think it just automatically creates the the, the file now instead okay. of just when it's exporting. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and we're gonna see that here in just I don't salt on that please. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, we're going to see that in action here in just a minute, too, whenever uh, we go into that area. Um, give me, I'm uh, trying to find something here real quick. Give me a second on another screen. Um, let's see. I think that's probably up for those announcements. Um, so I think what I'll, what I'll do is, uh, does anybody else know of anything in the community that's uh, noteworthy as far as announcements or kind of buzz that's going on uh, that I might have missed? Too sexy related or yeah more too sexy related but if it's remotely related with dnn and or octane that would probably be noteworthy as well so we have monaco available with dnn elements now oh that's a good point yeah so um if you're not familiar with dnn elements uh this is something that can be used in the context of too sexy because this is a basically a uh I don't know if you want to call it a design system, but it's a collection of uh, custom elements essentially uh, for that can be, it's just HTML and CSS in the end uh, that's used, but that can be pulled into a too sexy app, for instance, and used. So um, this will eventually be part of DNN, but uh, right now it's a separate repo uh, out here that can be consumed and is published on NPM. But you can see the list of all these different components. And uh, Daniel, you, uh, I was just giving context here. Feel free. I didn't mean to steal your thunder or anything, but you can talk about that. Oh, I mean, so the, uh, for those not familiar, basically you load up one single JavaScript loader file. <clears throat> and then everything available here you use just like a new HTML element. Nothing special to it. It has properties and... Uh, attributes just like a P tag would have. So if you need Monaco editor, as long as you load that HTML, you just need the uh, DNN Monaco editor tag and boom, it's there. So you save on all the setup you need to do for these things. I, you can probably search for the Monaco editor in this HTML file. So basically what David highlighted is what you'll need to load and then where you use it, right? You just, it's a DNN like line 949 there. So it's just DNN Monaco editor. Uh, we put some code here in the sample, but you don't even have to. You can just populate it with JavaScript or whatever you want. And uh, yeah, it's a very quick way to integrate this for code editing for whatever supported language. So it, it supports JavaScript and HTML and TypeScript and like all kinds of a razor a real really cool uh way if you need some code editing yeah so like in the context of uh like anybody that's used visual studio code you've used monaco editor because that is the editor that's used in the context of uh of visual studio code and um also like you can see it in a dnn instance on the sql console uh, the CSS editor, as well as the config editor, um, it's integrated in there. But that, um, you know, you can do the same type of thing in your in your Too Sexy app if you need a if you need an editor uh, within yep. there. So it's really, really cool. or custom module or whatever. It's a plain HTML element as long as you have those JavaScript files. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, and I'm, we're showing a lot here, but all it is is this tag, dnn-monaco-editor. So you import those two script files, and then uh, you just put this tag in there, and then code can be left blank if you need to, um, and it'll be an empty editor uh, there where you can put your own code in and wire up saving and all that kind of things. Yeah, so uh, let's see here. Let's, um, let's jump into... Um, I'll call it the presentation portion of this, but it, I, this is not meant to be a, a formal presentation by any means. It's uh, what I what I would encourage you to do if you do have a local instance, kind of follow on with me and do some of this because it's uh, it's it's something that I've noticed is not talked about a whole lot in the community, and that is if you are working on a project. Let's say you're building something for your business or for a client. Um, and you need to create a too sexy app or, you know, a, a series of apps or a collection of apps for a particular website. One of the things that you'd want to do, like if you were creating a custom module in DNN or in Octane, you would source control that 
custom module, right? You know, you would put it into some sort of source control, whether it's um, Visual Studio Online, using Team Foundation services, or Git uh, through there, or using GitHub. You, you would use that to track all the changes of your files and do version management and things like that. But in the context of a too sexy app, I mean, like, how would you do that? Um, it may seem trivial, you know, oh, just put those files in there. Well, I mean, yeah, you can. There's probably many different ways that you could go about doing this. Um, but working it out in a way that is a good workflow for your developers or a team of developers uh, to be able to easily update things, um, you know, without too much crazy overhead um, is a good idea, you know, to keep things in source control because maybe you've been used to just setting up a staging site and then you do all your development in the browser on that staging site, but it's hosted somewhere else and you don't really have a way to easily source control that without a jumping through a bunch of manual hoops, right? You know, copying and pasting. And then, well, what do you do about all that metadata that is configured in the context of uh, two sex, you know, you're setting up your app and you've got settings in there. You've got content types, you've got fields in the content types, you've got queries, you've got all kinds of stuff, you know, view uh, metadata information. Well, where is all that information stored? You may think, well, that's just in the database. Well, what's your backup plan, you know, for that? So I think it's good practice to learn how to use two sexy within you know, source control. So I thought I would do a walkthrough of one way to go about doing this. And I was going to kind of do it from scratch here. Um, what I, what I want to start out with is uh, creating, uh, I've created a folder within, you know, my C drive of dev and 2SXC. And I want to use, just for sake of time here, I'm going to use NV Quick Site to install a local DNN instance. So let's pretend like I'm the developer on this particular project, but I'm going to be working with a team of developers, but, you know, I'm going to kind of get things kicked off here. So I'm going to install a local instance of DNN. I've already got that downloaded. Let me just do 2SXC GitHub demo or something like that. Uh, let me change this to that folder that I just created. So I'm going to create a DNN instance. Now, this could just as easily be done with Octane um, if you are using that. So we're not going to focus too much. Oh, I forgot. To <laughs> my uh, my um, antivirus gets in the way sometimes of MV QuickSight for whatever reason, and I have to temporarily pause it. So don't attack my machine while I'm doing this. Okay, here we go. That was a joke. Y'all were supposed to really laugh at that. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so now we have a DNN instance. So um, it's going to be too sexy github demo dot loc. So we'll wait for that to load up. Now while that's, oh wow, it's already loaded up. Okay, so let's just Put in a temporary password here that's just wonderfully secure. We'll leave that as is, and we'll call this 2SXC GitHub demo, and we'll leave it as a, as a blank website, and I'll click continue, and we'll let that install. While that's installing, oh, wait, it's already installed. No, I'm just kidding. For the 12 <laughs> seconds, this will be installing. Yeah, because this is 9.11, uh, DNN 9.11. Uh, so it's going to be pretty darn fast. Oh, okay. For the 16 seconds. Ah, yeah, 17. 17. Seconds. There we go. All right, so we'll go to a website. Now, so we have a local DNN instance. I need to install Too Sexy. So let me find that. Now I'm going to use, just because I don't want to do, go on the bleeding edge, I've got it in a folder over here that I'm just going to drag over uh, and install 14.12.3, which is the latest LTS. So we'll install extension. I'm going to drag that file. I'm going to drag that file over to here. 
and install too sexy. So, I mean, how long did that take me? Less than two minutes, I guess. Now I've got a local development environment set up with too sexy and I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm ready to develop. So I've got DNN installed locally. It's all configured. I can access it and I've got too sexy ready to go. So I, you know, if you're not used to using those tools there, it's, it, it, it is a great, great way to do things. So now you'll see that in my folder that I had showed before, MV QuickSight created this folder called Too Sexy GitHub Demo. And within here, you have three folders. You have a database folder, which holds your SQL Server database. You got logs, which is your IIS logs. And you got a website folder, and that's the root of your DNN instance. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and get my command line kind of ready to go here. But Too Sexy, as you may or may not know, when you create an app inside of Too Sexy, it's going to create a folder using the app name inside of a folder under portals zero in this case, because this is my first portal that I've, that I've got. So I'm going to use this one. Um, it's going to create a 2SXC folder in here. And under that 2SXC folder, it's going to create a folder for each app name. So let's go ahead and add 2Sexy app module to a page. And let's uh, just pretend like we're going to create a, um, well, not pretend, we're going to do it. We're going to create an actual app here. So I'm going to get rid of the, the HTML modules to get put on this page by default, by DNN. And... I'm going to add an app module to the page because I'm going to, I'm going to build a custom app here. So I've added this. And, you know, the first thing I need to do is kind of kind of create an app because I don't, I don't have the app already. So I need to go into apps management here so I can create an app. So let's go ahead and do that. In the apps tab here, we're going to create an app. By default, too sexy has two apps already in it. If you've got a later version of uh, Too Sexy here like this, um, it has a content app, which is kind of, I don't know if you'd call this for beginners or not, but it's, it, it, it's where you have a lot of stuff kind of already put in there in a the context of a single app. And it's, it's just more for novice kind of um, use. I would say um, if you're, if you're creating multiple types of apps for different um, features or anything like that, you're going to probably want to create your own custom app. So, but th this method that I'm using could technically be used for, you know, either of these built in apps as well, but we're just going to do a custom one in this case. By the way, if anybody has any questions or comments or, you know, Hey, you idiot, that's not the way to do that. Um, go ahead and chime in. Uh, this is not meant to be formal. Um, so I'll create an app here and we'll call this, uh, yeah, we'll just call this demo and create. Now I've got an empty app here at this point, right? So over in my folder structure, you don't see anything yet because I haven't really interacted with this, um, here, but I'll just hit refresh just to make sure. And that is a bug, I think, in windows explorer i've noticed that if i do refresh it shows the context menu here in a weird styled way i don't know why it does that interesting uh, yeah yeah i don't know if anybody else has experienced that or not but that just started showing up after that last update so here in order to interact with this um, before i do anything before i create anything i'm going to go over oops sorry i shouldn't have done that I'm going to go into that app itself. So we're now in the admin interface for that demo app. I'm going to go over to app and here's the, the, the piece that you may or may not know about. If you go over in the app uh, to the app tab here, um, you'll see at the bottom of this, you'll see an app state versioning. And this is key to working with an app that is in a, um, in a Git um, environment, you know, where you're wanting to source control it. So I'm actually going to save the state of 
this app. And what that does here is it creates under portals zero, it creates that too sexy folder and the demo folder for the app. So now I didn't have to do anything to create the app at all other than just create an empty app and then come in here and save state. And the idea here is that you're working in your local, see, I don't have anything in this folder, by the way, except for the app underscore data folder, which has that app XML file that we were talking about a little bit earlier. But the idea here is that as I'm working on this app, let's just say I want to focus just on the demo app. I can go ahead and just open this up in Visual Studio Code. And I can work within here. So I don't have to work in the UI if I don't want to, but I can. But I can just you know quickly see things in here that I'm, I'm working on for the app. Now, the thing that we haven't done is we haven't really, even though we saved state using too, too sexy, we have not done anything in this, oops. Oops, if I get to that folder. Okay, so. So now I need to go into that demo folder that was created. I'm going to go into the website folder, which holds DNN. I'm going to go into portals. And I'm going to go into zero. And I'm going to go into 2SXC. What I want to do is get to that folder uh, for the demo app because I want to. Well, actually, I'm not even going to go that far. I'm going to go to the 2SXC folder. So right here reason I wanted to go to that folder is because we may have multiple apps that we want to create um, within the two sexy folder here, right? We, we created a, a blank demo app, but we may need to create other apps for a particular website or something like that. So we want to source control all of those apps in the same repo. Now you don't have to, you could separate those into multiple repos. Um, but we found that that makes sense. Like if we're working on client X, then we create a client X repo for structured content. And then we have all of the structured content for that particular client implementation in one repo. So what I want to do is I want to make this folder, this too sexy folder, I want to make it a Git repo locally. So I've got Git for Windows installed. So I'm going to use the command line here, but you could easily do this in, in Visual Studio Code as well. So kind of teach their own there, but I'm just going to do in this folder, I'm going to do git init, and that will set up this as a git repo. So if I go back and look at the folder now, you'll see that I have a hidden folder for dot git, and that's going to be where all of our git history and stuff like that is going to, all of our git metadata is going to be stored. So now I've got my local environment set up. I've got a local git repo. I'm ready to start working on my app, but I want to go ahead and get my entire environment set up. So where are we going to actually, you know, push this local Git repo to? Well, I'm going to use GitHub. So I'm going to go over to, for right now, our Envisionative repo here. I'm going to create a new repo, and we're going to call this um, 2SXC dash gh dash demo okay and i'll just go ahead and make this public that way you know for at least a period of time here you know people will be able to see how this looks on github um, may just leave it public for a while so we'll create this repository and i don't want to put anything in it i don't want to put any get ignore files or anything like that i want a completely empty repo here so now i actually have a you know a repo out here on github right so i can take this url and I can set that up as a remote of my local Git instance. So I'm going to do Git remote add. I'm going to call this upstream. And I'll explain why in just a little bit. This is just more best practices for GitHub. And I paste in that URL that I just copied into my clipboard there. So that's going to be my, oops. Hey. Oh, yeah, it's oh, new with Git. Good. You have to make it safe. Yep, I forgot about that. Even though you created it. So I'm just going to do exactly what it tells me to do, and I'm going to add an exception for this particular. Um, yeah, if you trust yourself. 
Yeah, I, I do do trust myself. In the case. So, <laughs> so now I'm going to go back up and try to run that, um, adding the remote there. So it looks like nothing happened, but if I type get remote now, you'll see, and I'll do dash V. And if Daniel was doing this, he would do dash V, 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 V. Correct. Uh, yep. Yeah but they, they all work with just one V. Uh, and you see that I have an up, I have a re remote named upstream that ties to our GitHub repo. Now, what I want to do from there is, even though I haven't set this up on GitHub yet, I know that I'm getting ready to. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to just modify this command. I'm going to add another remote called origin. And this is going to be a fork of the Envisionator repo um, that's going to be on my personal GitHub account. So this is just, you know, you don't have to go through this step and do this, but it kind of helps in the sense that um, when you're working with a team, you'll want to, you know, you've got your upstream repo for your organization, but me as an individual developer, I want to work off of my fork on GitHub and I want to make pull requests for the upstream repo to merge my branches from a fork. So, you know, you don't have to do this. You could work off of the same repo if you wanted to, um, but that that's keeps things a little bit cleaner. That way, if you completely muck up something in your fork, you're not, you know, messing with the, with the uh, upstream repo there, but I could just as easily work off of, um, the Envisionator repo only and push branches up to it to do pull requests on GitHub. So I don't want to go into too much of the mechanics of Git and GitHub flow and things like that or Git flow, um, but uh, that's just kind of the way we work. Okay, so now I've got I've got two I've got a local Git repo and I have got two remotes set up. So at this point. Any changes that I make locally, which it looks like I'm on a main branch here because I haven't configured my local Git um, environment to default to develop. So this is another kind of Git GitHub flow thing where we usually work off of a develop branch and then uh, switch, you know, that, that'll that be the working branch. And then any kind of release that we do would be on the main branch up there. So what I'm going to do locally, I'm just going to, do get checkout dash B and that's creating a new branch. I'm going to call it develop because that'll be what we kind of use. And what I want to do is I want to do get status to see what changes have been made. Well, because we initialized this as repo, we had created a folder in it called demo. Git already knows about that change. So what I want to do is just go ahead and push this to the repo so that we have something in GitHub uh, for this. So basically anytime, you know, we do something, you know, here we'll be able to to push it out um, to that as, a, as an update to it. But this just initializes our work, right? So I'm going to do git add everything from this directory below because it's just what I, what I want to do in this case. And then I'll do a commit message for this and we'll say initial commit and then I'm going to do a direct push to the upstream repo because I don't have my fork set up yet. So I can't really do any pull requests because there's nothing been there. So this is really just kind of the first time, but I'll do git push. And then by the name of my remote upstream and then the name of the branch develop. So what that's going to do is it's going to take everything that I have in my local directory instance here and it's pushed it up to this repo. Well, I can just, control click that if I want to, and that'll open it up over here. Now on our repo, we actually have demo app underscore data. So we actually have a commit here, right? So now that I have a commit here, I can go ahead and set up my fork. Now I'm going, I know I'm kind of going fast. So does anybody have any questions? What is Git? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, shelve that one. So here I'm going to fork <laughs> on my personal GitHub account of this that way any future changes that we make i can push to a branch on my fork and then do a pr uh, from envisionator okay so in the essence of time here because we're going to run out of time here pretty quickly i'm gonna um, 
go ahead and go to the local website. And we're ready now at this point. We don't have any pending changes. So if I do get status, you'll see it. Think, oop, not stash. Status. You'll see it. Things are clean here. If I were in Visual Studio Code, you'll see here on my um, source control thing here. Oops. It does not have an awareness yet. Let me reopen that. So I'll just do it from here. Code dot. Reopen it. Sometimes uh, Visual Studio lately has been not playing nicely with Git. Okay. So now it's just kind of scanning this. So it knows that we're, we don't have any changes. I'm on my develop branch. So let's say I'm ready to start building the app now, right? So I'm going to implement, let's just say I'm going to implement, you know, a content type. So what I want to do is locally, I want to create a branch. So I want to do get checkout dash B, that's a new branch. And I'm going to do, you know, content type. That could be any name you want it to be, but it needs to be something meaningful for the work that you're doing, right? So now that I have a branch from a Git perspective, I'm ready to start making changes. So this is kind of the flow, make your branch and then go into your local instance and start making the changes that you want to make. So in this case, I'll go to the admin of the demo app and we'll go to content type and let's create a new content type. Let's call this, um, I don't know, um, basic, you know, or I don't know. What, FAQ. what did you say, Daniel? Do an FAQ. Oh uh, yeah, that would, that'd be, well, yeah, we can kind of start an FAQ. That's fine. All right. So, um, we'll call it FAQ. So in an FAQ, we need a couple of fields there, right? So we need to add a field for a, oops, didn't mean to right click. We'll do question and that could be a string. Uh, that looks good. We can do, uh, an answer. You know, that's the basics of an FAQ anyways, right? So those two fields, both of those can be strings. Well, actually this one here, the answer could be, let's just go rich text or something for this one, right? Uh, WYSIWYG editor. So that way we've got a, just a basic text field for the question. And then the answer could be rich text. All right. So we go save. And now we're, we're, we're done. We've created our content type. Our two fields have been added to the content type. I think we're ready to, to go ahead and commit those changes. All right. So in this case, all we've changed is metadata, right? We haven't, we haven't created any views or anything. So we still don't have any file changes, right? So if I do get status or here, you won't see any changes. So you're probably thinking, well, how does this work? Well, that's where that save state comes back into play. So if you go back into, well, in this case, now that we actually have an app, I can go ahead and select this app as what this instance of two sexy is going to be. Um, I may have to refresh. Let me do this. Oh, it's not going to work because we don't have any views in there yet. So I have to go back into the the um, admin demo or apps management and go to the app. But here, now that we've got this data in here, um, we can go back over to the app tab, scroll to the bottom, and we've done the work that we want to do. So now we need to resave the state. So if we save state, what that's going to do is it's going to update that app.xml file that's in the app underscore data folder with all the changes that we just made. And we're going to go look at that. So now if we do a get status, we see that something changed and there's what we were talking about before. So there's that app.json file that's kind of new, just showed up recently in, in two sexy 14, I believe. Okay. So what, what, what does that mean? So we can look over here now in our, in our visual studio, and we can see what kind of changed. Well, web config was added to the root because it realized uh, we're working on Razor implementation here. So it gives us some kind of helper here for Visual Studio. That's great. Um, the app JSON file, this is the new file that I'm not familiar with and I don't know what it all means, but it, it created that. And then here is all the changes that we just made to the app. And all it is is some metadata, but you can kind of deduce from this that, okay, we, add, we created the 
a content type called FAQ. Cool. Uh, we created a, a field, an attribute in the case of XML here. So the attribute set, you know, that holds the name of the content type. And this is a question. And that question is um, an input type of string. Uh, and it has, I mean, you can just see this is stuff that Too Sexy takes care of for us, but we don't ever modify these files directly unless you really know what you're doing in here um, and understand the inner workings of Too Sexy. But it took care of it. So that allows us to work in the browser for meta data changes. It allows us to work in our Visual Studio Code environment for any views or um, other types of flat files that we're working with on the site. But we just let Too Sexy do the work. So we, we, we make our changes in the UI, come back over to the tab uh, for app and save state. And now we're ready to do a commit locally in our Git. So I'm good with all the changes that was made here. So I can just do Git add everything. And we'll do a commit message. And we'll say add FAQ content type. And then what I'm going to do this time, instead of pushing it to upstream, I'm going to push it to my fork with a branch called the same thing, content dash type. So I'm going to push that. And now, oops. Uh, I think I named that wrong. Should be David dash Poindexter. So pardon me. Let me do get remote set URL for origin to um, HTTPS, oops, github.com. I probably should have just copied and pasted it, but uh, to sxc-gh-demo.get, that should fix that. Now I can just do get push origin content type again, and that should work this time because that should be my fork. So now what I can do is right here in the command line, I can just control click this and it'll actually start a pull request for me. So what it did though, before we, before we do that, if we go to my fork, which we're on right now, and we refresh this, we'll see that if we change here, content type branches out there. So that's what I had just pushed out there. So now I've got that branch out there and it would have the changes to it. So I could either, you know, compare and do a pull request here, or I can just click on that from my command line here. And that'll automatically open up a pull request that tries to pull from my content type branch on my fork repo into the Envisionative repo, the develop branch. So that, that would be the correct kind of flow there. And if I scroll down a little bit, we can see that it, oh, okay, it added an app.json file and it updated app XML um, to add those two new fields and content type there. And it added that web config file. So that looks good to me. So um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to copy and paste this in here. Uh, I'm not going to put any of that stuff on it. So I do create pull request. And then the, I, somebody would come and review this and they would approve it. And ultimately we would merge that into develop um, so that we have it. So there's the kind of the, the flow of how we do that. And then we can delete that branch off of our fork. So now we, we've kind of covered the creation of the app. So you just basically rinse and repeat for everything that you want to do uh, in, in Too Sexy for that app and building it out. If I could get my browser back open, um, including your views and your views will just become, you know, CS, uh, CS HTML files that are inside of the respective app folder. So you can work with those just in Visual Studio if you wanted to, um, just to give you a bit more context. Of course, uh, Too Sexy uses Monaco Editor for the file editing experience in there. So, um, you know, you have a nice browser experience too, but sometimes it's just easier to work in Visual Studio Code. So you may be thinking, okay, well, that's all great. Um, but what about when you go to get this on another 
site. So, cause we're working on a local instance here right now. Well, that's when, you know, you would actually take, let's, let's pretend that we've built this app out completely and we're ready now to put it on a, on another site. We can come into apps management here, go to apps and we can actually, oops, I'm sorry. I was actually already there and wasn't even paying attention. Um, we could go to here and we would export the entire app. When we get it to a state that we believe we've got all of the basic features complete in it and we're ready to kind of work with it on a staging site for a client, we would export the entire app and that would create a zip that we could then come to the other instance of uh, DNN on the staging site and we would import that entire app. So instead of creating an app from scratch, you know, you could just come into here and instead of creating an app, you would import the app and use that. And that gives you the starting point for that site. Things get a little bit more complicated now that you're working on that site because you might need to make changes on the staging site that also need to be tracked in your Git environment, right? So that's when things get a little bit more complicated, um, where if you make a change on a staging site, you do need to do that locally as well. And that's more of a manual thing. And that's one of the pieces of overhead that you're going to deal with um, when you're trying to use source control with Too Sexy. But hopefully this helps everybody uh, to know kind of how to protect your development environment and give the, uh, you know, nice backup and version history and, and all that. Any questions or concerns or I'm just looking at the chat now. I haven't been able to, uh, <laughs> to uh, keep up with it over here. Okay. It looks like we had one question. How would changes to app.xml affect the DNN database? Um, if you restore an older version or push changes to master branch, wouldn't it create a nastily mismatch with the actual DNN database and the two sexy app? data present there. Um, if you change the answer type, uh, to, okay, that's a different question. Um, yeah, so the it's a good question, but this is just metadata um, that is ultimately stored in the database. You're absolutely right on that. Um, but that's what the state is for. So if th this is where the extra overhead that I was mentioning comes in. So if you already have it on a staging site, but you also have your local instance, when you start working on that staging site, if you have to make changes to any of the metadata, so let's just say you had to change a field type or you had to, you know, add some properties or something to it or change properties to it, there's a couple of ways you can do that. If you have access to that hosting environment, then you could also use the same kind of functionality that we've used here that when you make those changes, you could save the state there, go and grab that Apex mail file there, copy that into your local Git branch that you just created for the changes, and it would see the changes and it would track the history of those changes. So that's one way you can do it, but that's only if you really have access to those flat files on your on your um, staging site. Um, so that you know, we always try to like let's say we're building an entire website and we have eight apps that need to be created for that website. We'll actually create all of those, you know, one developer usually is responsible for creating most of those, but you know, even if it's multiple, we would do that locally and get it as far as we can to get that good, strong starting point point first, because we know we're going to have to deal with that extra overhead, you know, when, whenever we start working on the actual staging site. There's probably some better ways to do this, you know, especially if, if you have better access to the to server environment. Um, of course, you could um, get control right on the server. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but, you know, depending on your environment, you may be comfortable uh, with that. Uh, we don't do it that way um, just for security reasons, but um, yeah, it, there's multiple ways to approach something like this, but uh, this is one way you can do it. And it's a nice little feature with the app state versioning stuff. Hopefully that answers your question, Joe. Well, um, 
that took a little bit longer than I thought it was going to take. And I apologize for that. Um, does, um, does anybody have any tips or anything they want to share real quick before we wrap this, uh, this meetup up? Crickets, crickets. <laughs> Daniel, I know you've created I, so many of these things that you have all kinds of tips you can just uh, share, right? Me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm noob on this. That's pretty much <clears throat> it. Like, you know, you've taught me so. <laughs> Did you answer the question about the database fields? Like if you change a content type, then in the database... You touched that? Okay, sorry. How yeah, so the the one piece, though, that I didn't answer, and I'm glad you said it like that, Daniel, because it just triggered me. Um, I may not have answered this real well. So I talked about the saving state, but I didn't talk about the restore state. So what you can do is if you make a, a chain, I got to be careful how I word this, but you can actually take, so let's say that I'm working on this project and I need Daniel to pick up this project because I got to go work on another project and he needs to create this local instance for himself and get to the same state that I am at. Well, he could literally clone the repo here into his local DNN instance in that same folder structure. And he would go into to sexy and he would just create the blank app do nothing else just create the blank app and it has to be named exactly what those folders are because too sexy is not aware of what those apps are just by you know those files being in the folders so if he creates an a, an app for every app that's in there you know if you have those eight apps or whatever you just create empty apps and then for each one of those he can come into and come over to the app and he would just simply restore state and what that would do is it would pull in everything that's been done and it would be working exactly the same way as it is in the other developers environment in my environment. The only caveat to that is content. So if, if I had added content, um, so typically when we're developing apps, we're just using demo content and that's all we're not building out the entire content, you know, the shoes for every single app. It's just that demo content item. And, you know, that's not going to be source controlled because that's, that's stored in a separate folder. And I'll show you real quick here. So within here, yeah, here we go. So under portal zero, in addition to the 2SXE folder that it created, it also created an Atom folder. So that's where all the images and so forth are going to go. And you have a folder for each app. And we choose not to source control the images uh, because it's like, where does that start? Where does it end? I mean, we could, but I don't know. When you're developing, sometimes you just need to load a bunch of content in there that you don't in the end want you know, to be on the staging site when you put it there. Because when you export everything, it's going to pull all that stuff in as well. So it's just one of those decision points. We don't source control this folder because it can get unruly in certain more, especially more complex apps that have a lot of data um, and imagery. But that's how you would actually restore another instance of DNN to the same state is using the restore state. If you just plop that app XML and all related folder files and folders in there and then restore state that will reset everything to exactly what that file is configured to do. So it kind of gets rid of your data and everything. So I would not do that on a staging site. If you have built out a bunch of stuff on the staging site, you don't want to use that feature to restore from your local instance, unless you're just getting started. <laughs> you could do that and be okay with it, but um, we don't use that method for um, a staging or a production site. And usually it's just for the development of the apps themselves, not as much for content. Because when you have more than one person, whatever is the image ID that David added on his instance is not my image ID. So it's going to keep trying to look for my image ID in that. And then the same thing like with every content that you added on the site. Mine might be ID 345 and his is 568. 
So it's going to be like, oh my God, I don't know where anything is. So you kind of have to reinstall. You know, when we do the separating thing, Vision X, we usually try to, each person works in just one app. So we don't have this stepping on each other's toes and, and things like that. Because it gets quite complicated when you start having more and more content. Yeah, it's true. If you do add images, you know, to like if I were to add them to my local instance, you would see if you navigate through to the Atom folder, it's going to have a bunch of, you know, good based image names or file names that are in here. And those are referenced by IDs through that app XML um, file. So that that does bloat your app XML file too, because like content references are stored in there as well. So um, yeah, it can get kind of ugly. And, you know, we, we see that it's not perfect the way that we do it. That's why I mentioned there's so many different ways you could go about doing this, but we found this this works pretty good uh, for for most use cases, just with the caveat that you're going to have that extra overhead. Um, there is one other question that was in chat here about um, copying assigned data rows from a from one DNN install to another, you know, like if you had 10 FAQ entries, um, how could you copy those so that they display on the on the second DNN site? Well, that's where you can get into the export of parts of a particular app. So if you're dealing with data, um, you can actually, eh, it's an easier way to do this too. If you're inside the app and you're looking at the data itself, and if we had, let's just add an item in here. So, so let's just say I call this Q1 and this is gonna be Q1 answer. And let's say you had 10 of those in there. You could actually just right here at the content type level, you could actually take and export that data from here. And if you had the app that matched the exact same thing, you could do the import on the other DNN instance and they'll pull in that data. Um, a question, David, I, I sort of see what you're doing there, but how does it get it? How do you attach that then to a particular instance on a page? Ah, now that that's a good question. That's where you, the replace works. You know, that's a bit of a manual process. So like you would put that instance on the page, assign it to that app type, and then you would use for each content item, you're going to have to replace with an existing content item. So you know how you have the multiple action um, kind of buttons that are up there, you know, where you got yeah. it and things like that. There's one called replace. And you can ah. use that to replace that current content item with a new one. There's also an add existing one that you can use to add an existing content item to that particular instance. So that's a bit of a manual process uh, for, you know, instances of the, of the app on the page. Because the data could all be back there, but not associated with that instance of the module, right? That, so. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this has been really interesting because I'm scrambling like heck trying to learn too sexy as it continues to evolve, and I know n nothing about GitHub. So I think this is a video I might watch a few times. This is great. Well, I talked really fast, but feel free to ask any questions. Uh, you know, on the side as you go through it. Um, again, uh, it's uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to, and there are definitely some gotcha spots along the way uh, that you that you run into. But uh, once you get used to the flow, you know it it it, it flows pretty smoothly. Uh, so I hope that's helpful for everybody. Um, I I was hoping we'd have a little bit of time for more tips and things like that, but I could see this one was pretty interesting uh, to a lot of people. So it may have more questions, and if we need to kind of do more of this next next meetup. That's totally fine as well. I haven't really planned that one out yet, but if anybody does have ideas on that one, it'll be the first Friday in February and uh, um, happy to kind of format that meetup to to meet everybody's needs. Um, it doesn't always have to be a presentation type thing too. We can do a workshop or something like that where, you know, different people share screens or we do a, um, a uh, hangout on uh, discord or something like that where multiple screens can be shared and all that good stuff too so uh, just let me know if you have any ideas on this we'll let this evolve naturally
I'll also try to get this uh, meeting recording posted out onto YouTube. I just need to create a brand channel out there for the meetup and kind of get that set up initially to be able to put out there, but I'll go ahead and get it rendered and ready to go for everybody. But thanks everybody for joining. That was great. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thanks. And we'll see you next month. <laughs>